Man, I, I, I tell you, even just like coming here to fly here from, um, from Oregon, I, I was telling the lady at the ticket counter where, where I was going, she asked why I was going to Nashville. And I just said, I'm going there to see some friends. They do a podcast about grief and God and stuff. She goes, oh boy, do we all need that. And she said, I have a big family and I lose someone every year. And she said, one year we lost, she goes, I lost six people in one year. I'm like, wow. You know, it's every day. And it's interesting, I had this thought, when he was sick, I was already grieving that he was gonna pass. I mean, even though you're, you know, you're encouraging to him and it's like, come on, you know, brother, I'm gonna support you in your fight and all that. There was a part of that process that I got to sort of grieve. But when he passed, for the, in the moment, you feel like you're the only person in the world grieving. The reason when I sat down next to your brother, who's dying, I just wanted to touch him. I just wanted to feel where he was at. And I touched his leg. It was like I felt safe sitting right beside me. Welcome to the Good Grief, Good God Show, part one of episode 18. Hosted by Grammy nominee and Emmy award-winning hit songwriter of 15 top 10 songs, including nine number ones, Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. Join Brad during season one monthly on the first and third Tuesdays on your favorite audio platform or on video on YouTube for raw, honest conversation about surviving things that suck. For today's episode, Brad welcomes actor, director, and writer, Eric Close. Eric has starred in dozens of TV shows, including Without a Trace as FBI agent Martin Fitzgerald in Nashville as Nashville's mayor, Teddy Conrad. Strauss Zelnick, a mutual friend of Brad and Eric's, was spot on when he predicted a lifelong friendship before introducing them over 20 years ago. A friendship that included Eric being there without hesitation for Brad when Brad's oldest son, Sage, passed away to Brad being there for Eric when Eric's brother, Christopher, succumb to cancer. You're about to find out that Eric is a God-fearing husband, father, brother, and of course, a close and dear friend to Brad and Michelle. I'm producer Matt Pivato. To learn more about today's guest, Brad, and the show, check the description where you'll also find clickable links to connect to the show on social media and to visit goodgriefgoodgodshow.com. Lastly, if you'd like to help support the show, hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a comment or a five-star review. On the behalf of Brad's wife, Michelle, and segment producer and guest booker, Lisa Bolt, thank you for tuning in. The Good Grief, Good God Show is brought to you in loving memory of Sage Michael Warren. Part two premieres Tuesday, August 29th. Well, Erica hooked me up to go to the Bluebird last night. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I, had, I had two seats where I was getting ready to go pick up my buddy, Andy, and we were going to the 6, 6 p.m. show, and Carlene calls me, or Kayleen, Carlene. Carlene calls me, and she goes, hey, Eric, I'm sorry, but there's a tornado warning, and we're going to cancel all the shows, and they just shut it down. And that didn't drop a, there wasn't a drop of rain. So I went down there, went to dinner at True Food, and hung out, and I was like, wow, that sucks, because it blew north, and then didn't come in until late last night. Who was supposed to play? I don't know. I was just, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, it was Tim Pan, yeah. But we're playing, did you know we're playing once a month at the Bluebird? Really? Called Warren Wednesdays, every, uh, the second Wednesday of every month. And we'll bring like like younger writers in or or different writers or new. We're going to actually have Claire and Brandon, I think. So it's like Warren Wednesdays once a month. It's been really fun. Your brother would go Jason Isbell or something by himself, get a lawn seat, stand in the back, watch the sunset, drink a beer by himself and then whatever, and then like leave without having to have anyone there with him. I'm like, I've never been to a concert by myself. He's like, oh, it's the greatest thing. I always needed someone to ex experience the experience with me to prove that it had happened. I never really felt like if I did something alone, that it was provable fun. I don't know. It must be something because I do a lot of stuff, but I'm the same way. I do a lot of stuff by myself. I'll go and just, I'll just go and what is, is that? Stuff. Is that genetic or, or did your parents, because you and Chris both are very comfortable just showing up alone doing something i don't know man i just i just like i guess there's something we just like experiences and so i guess we just enjoy it like i i hike a lot by myself you know i'll take my dog but when before we got a new puppy i was out i would hike just go out in the forest and hike for hours sometimes with no trail like no with trails no, no trail, but, but, but i also just go with the dog i'll bushwhack meaning i'll go off the trails and just go as long as i know where i'm where the i'm pretty good direct yeah you, know, you have direction good sense of direction, good, good sense of direction. Do, yeah because yeah. if you get turned around out in the woods it'd be bad it's gonna be bad we could be on a motorcycle somewhere and you just literally knew how to get back via whatever roads were available <laughs> i'm like how on earth do you do that i always just turn for... left turn left turn yes. left turn left turn left you're gonna eventually get I would back have been in a circle though <laughs> i mean like a bad circle and you you lived here for two months 
and I had been here for 20 something years and you're showing me how to get places. You always like, used to joke, you're like, you're, you're here and you know more people than I do. You do know more people. You would meet all of my friends and then their friends that I had been meeting to meet for 10 years or something. And you guys are, I'm like, oh, I'm hiking with Tracy Gershon and Ken Levitan. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, those are my <laughs> old, You probably remember this story. So we were in, we were in London and we were staying in Mayfair. We were on our way to like some pub to watch Wimbledon and Carrie's behind me and she's talking to my friend Robert and Annie, and she's like, she's she goes, everywhere we go, Eric, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, Eric runs into somebody he knows. Yeah, and at, I hear her saying that, and I'm kind of smiling like, yeah, and I look, and just as she says that, Ken Levinson comes out and this out of this door in the middle of London. I'm like, we're hugging, and my wife goes, oh my, we'll told you, look, look. And it was the, it was like on the spot. Michelle says that about me, but I, you are even even more like adventurous, uh, relational, relationally, yeah. and just you guys will just go to the, just go to the Aborigines and, and <laughs> have been there yet, but yeah, I'm sure I'd run into somebody. Yeah, just run into someone that you know, hey, and also buddy. live with them for three months and hike and wear the loincloth and whatever it requires. I mean, I uh, know I draw the line at the loincloth. That's but we uh, actually that might not be bad. It'd be kind of freeing. Um, so when we went to South Africa this summer, we land and we had good seats. So we got off the plane pretty quick. The four of us, it was Carrie and I and the girls. And we've been flying for how many, 18 hours or where we flew. It's crazy. You leave Atlanta and fly literally over the ocean till you land almost. I mean, it is a lot of hours. You look at the map and you're going, I can't believe we're over open ocean for 10 hours. Yeah. And they do like go over islands. There's a little bit of there must I did be, there LA's. has to be places to land if there's something goes down because yeah, anyway, we land, we get into the we have to go through immigration, right? We're standing there and I'm talking to my wife's, you know, the kids are here and we're talking, and all of a sudden, right behind me, I hear this lady say, I mean, we had been there 15 minutes in Africa. <laughs> hey, air close. I'm like, I go like like, okay, this is crazy. I turn around. She goes, hey, so-and-so, we met at, we met at um, Patty Heaton's house. Patty Heaton played Ray Romano's wife on Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah. So she was having a fundraiser for World Vision. And literally, she goes, we met at Patty he Heaton's house a few years ago. And I'm like, oh, hey, how you doing? Good, good. What are you doing down here? She goes, oh, I'm down here doing a World Vision thing, blah, blah, blah. And I go, we're, on, we're going on safari. We have, uh, we're, doing, we're opening a school here and we're doing all this stuff, right? And she goes, I didn't even see your face. She goes, I recognized your voice. That's what she said to me. <laughs> Just hearing me talk to my kids and my wife, she recognized my voice. But my wife just looked at me. She goes, we've been here 15 minutes. And you <laughs> were running into South somebody you know. I guess it's yeah. not that strange then that, that how uh, we, we met our, our mutual friend, Strauss Elnick, who's a major uh I mean, he's a mogul in every sense, but he was the CEO of, of the everything New York portion of our record label when we were signed to RCA. And uh, we, crazy that we became friends with him uh, because it's super unlikely, especially then. We're like really broke young musicians just signed a record deal and he's literally J JFK Jr. And we had this unlikely friendship. So we're going to stay at his country house in Bedford, New York. And and he said, uh, yeah, there's a friend of mine that's going to come up. You know, he always had these, he always has like, young workout friends that we all use meet up with this group of male models to work out. It's kind of a strange thing. So I assume you're going to be one of those guys. He goes, no, no, this friend of mine, Eric Close, he's an actor and um, you guys will be friends the rest of your life. I'm like, how do you know? He's, no, no, he won't. Of course not. And I've met a lot of people at Charles's house, great people, but you never see him again or whatever. And uh, so you come to, I don't even remember what the occasion was, but I guess we just had dinner and Brett and I were still drinking. So we, um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember. This he had a little, little story gets little, good. This yeah, great story. He had that little guest house beside their house, and we were, we were all on the patio smoking cigarettes because no one around there smoked cigarettes. No, nope. Brett and I were, and I think we gave you a couple that night. And so I'm like, yeah. hey, we need. Some. I I, I smoke. I didn't even smoke, and I smoked that night. Right, <laughs> that was one of those nights when the non-smoker smoked. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he had a wine cellar back then. And uh, we, I, it's probably two thousand dollar bottle of wine. We went. Yeah, and this is well, the part of the story where Strauss never invites us back. Just to, <laughs> it's too late now. It's too many years. We have statute limitations. Has escaped yeah. that. And we went and got a handful of probably really expensive bottles of wine. I think we were probably drinking them from the jug. And we sat out there for like five hours and drank all of his wine and smoked cigarettes. And we became friends. 
and have been friends ever since. And that was at least at least 25 years ago. Yeah, because it's, our it's pre-kids. Sage and Katie were crawling around the floor of the Universal Hilton sometime later after that. Yeah. And she's 24, right? Yep, she's 24. Yeah. So that would happen. They were. She was walking, and Sage was crawling. I remember saying, "Hey, you need to start walking, dude." This, you know, girls walk before boys do. But I think they're close to the same age, really close. Yeah, yeah. Katie's twenty-four. She'll be twenty-five in October. Yeah, you know, it's <clears throat> crazy. Strauss said the same thing to me. He called me up and he goes, "You need to come up, come up to the country to Bedford." And I have these two guys that are on, you know, their brothers are on our, one of our sub labels of RCA, right? Yeah. And he goes, you guys will be friends for life. That's his exact same. And he wasn't wrong. How does he know that stuff? He's, he does really know when he says something like that. He's almost always right. Yep. And, you know, there, it was, there was only like six of us there. There was that guy, Scott, who was the president of NBC at the time. Oh, Scott Sasser right. was there. We should have made was, friends with yeah, them. Yeah, I know, right? I know. I, I, I thought it was gonna it was gonna work out. You would have had two or three more hit shows if we hadn't been drunk yeah, that night. Exactly. Sorry, man. I ruined your career. <laughs> the uh and then there was a guy who owned his own literary company. I don't know if you remember that, I don't yep. remember the guy's yep. name, and then a couple other and, and I remember Strauss going, I'm the poorest guy in the room. And I'm like, No, we are. <laughs> like, the, the Warrens and I are the poorest guys in the room. Believe me, you we were the poorest guys in the room, especially at, at that moment, which i I take pride in that. I just think it's good, it's good to be the the poorest guy in the room. He's hungry, right? Yeah, yeah. You can arrange the room where you're the richest guy almost no matter what. Isn't it cool how that happened, though? I mean, it's not. It's we always crazy. Say it's, like, it's not by accident that we were introduced and that we connected and developed such a friendship. And and the yeah. thing is, because so you're you're kind of a a, a unicorn in, in Hollywood because you're a Christian guy, and and we were not very. Christian acting at the moment, but we had been raised with these values, you know, that we, um, you know, you kind of drug along behind you in a trailer, but they weren't really part of our deal at the time, but they were still kind of there. And I think there was something in that, that we're like, we're all in the entertainment business, but we were, we were different than everyone else at dinner and enough of a way to where we kind of like kept being friends. And I remember, um, we were in LA and we were supposed to go over to your house for breakfast or something and meet your wife. And it was like one of the early, maybe we'd already met Carrie, but um, we we were so hammered that we just didn't make it. I remember calling you and telling you something. And I was like, God, that is such a crappy friend. You know what I mean? So, and yet we somehow, the friendship, our friendship maintained until we got sober and then we really got close. You know what I mean? It's crazy, but like, um, and we have been through death and whatever and that's funny because you're um some of our conversations between sage and christopher at the juice bar were one of the things one of the little dominoes for me that went okay the podcast would be kind of helpful because yeah we were kind of doing the podcast before it, you know you did this as like the the juice bar podcast the juice you know? bar podcast brief hour at the at the juice bar because we would kind of get into it and like, cause I kind of beat the church up a little bit in here and I don't mean to do that as a, just like an exercise. There's no bitterness in it, but I am, um, comfortable with the idea that I question everything. And I think God's okay with that. Um, I think we just, anything yeah, think, standard that we just handle it. Yeah. Paint, yeah. I think he's okay. You're a good enough human being and a close enough friend to where I could bring whatever it was and say, you ever wonder this? And you'd be like, yeah, we would just delve into that thing. And, um, I don't know that we ever found find the answer to anything exactly, but I think the questions are okay. Well, think about, I mean, Jesus hanging out with his disciples. I mean, these dudes were, these were rough dudes. I mean, they were fishermen and uh, they were doing all kinds of things. And and it's funny how, it, you know, if you, if you said to a certain person in the church, like, oh, I'm sure those guys were sitting around farting in the olive grove and throwing, you know, joking and stuff. They Cussing. Go, oh. Jesus never farted. You know, it's like, it's like, come on. If he was it's all like, human. Yeah, exactly. And they they were brothers and they were, and they wrestled with some heavy topics and things that he would say. And they're like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean by that? And you want me to do what? And, and it was, he just flipped everything upside down and, and, and wrestled with stuff. And I think that's, you know, we were wrestling, we've been wrestling with some heavy subjects. I mean, losing a brother and losing a son and coming here to fly here from Oregon. Lady at the ticket counter where I was going, she asked why I was going to Nashville. And I just said, oh, I'm going there to see some friends. They do a podcast about grief and God and stuff. She goes, oh boy, do we all need that, you know, that support. And she said, I have a big family and I lose someone every year. And she said, one year we lost, she goes, I lost six people in one year. I'm like, wow, you know, it's every day. 
there's people going, you know. And it's interesting. I had this thought when my brother, and I, I'll go back up a minute. When, yeah, we can when, circle as much when as he we was, want. When he was sick, I was already grieving that he was going to pass. I mean, even though you're, you know, you're encouraging to him and it's like, come on, you know, brother, I'm going to support you in your fight and all that. There was a part of that process that, you know, I, I got to sort of grieve. And, um, but until he passed, I always kind of felt like it was other people who, you know, I mean, when, when, I, what I mean is when he passed for the, in the moment, you feel like you're the only person in the world grieving. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden as the days go by, you realize there's so many people going through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You mean of, of like their own grief. Yes, their own, yeah. Their yeah. Own, because, yeah. Uh, and, and it's funny if you will, if you look for it, God will show you where the other people, where the need is. Cause we were, Michelle and I are hanging on by a thread. You know, we were literally hanging on by a thread and it's kind of like, okay, show me what to do. And it was like very obvious, um, several things, but the, the groups that we formed and doing this podcast and being open in a conversation, it doesn't take away the pain, but it dissipates like by 50% just saying it to somebody else who understands. So you and I actually pre-saged dying because we we struggle with it and we're, we're parenting at the same time at the same age. And we had, uh, although... Uh, different in a lot of ways, boys versus girls and, and different levels of activity, just sharing parenthood and the lack of a freaking manual to know exactly what to do. It's extremely helpful. It's, it's crazy because, um, you know, we kind of swam through this whole thing together. And then when Sage passed, but Christopher was sick, we kind of, I feel like that, was it two years, a year and a half, whatever it was, that, that amount of time allowed you and I became, um, well, you became a confidant for me, and I think the same me for you. Yep. Because what happened to us put me in a place to where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna. I'm always yeah. Let's let's let me take a casserole over to someone, and then that's that's it. I'm like no, no, I'm, I'm gonna sit in this with my friend. <clears throat> I'm gonna just sit in it. Like we're gonna go ahead and just go and just be there. And uh, well, I'm gonna wait till later we get into it. But there's there's some crazy special moments with your brother in the passing. But until you've experienced that thing, like your brother, your son, even a parent at a young age, I mean, at some point, the parent, the natural order of things is for the parent to leave, but not, not when you're 20, not when you're, not when you're 30. And then, and then whatever time it is, it's strange. But uh, I sort of think this is the first time I ever just said, I'm just going to sit right here and just be present, not trying to demand Eric's time, but whenever it is that he's in the mood and needs to talk about it, we're just going to just and flesh yeah. it out and, and not always having the not having the answers there's times just being there yeah you know i mean well, not having any answers exactly <laughs> just like being able to just sit in it i mean someone was telling me uh a, so a friend of mine and my wife's uh she started this organization called grieving mothers because she lost her son in a tragic way and uh her friend i ran into her at starbucks the day before i came here and she was telling me it's her best friend she said that the the day when this all went down and 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 our friend Jackie was just on the floor in a puddle, just you know pain and grief. She, uh, our friend Kathy, her best friend, just said, "All I could do is just put my hand on her mm. back, and that was it." I didn't, I didn't, you know. It was just, I'm just going to be there, and and you know, those there's a lot of those moments over the years, and you know, it's so cool if you think about our where our friendship started, and God knew that we would we would one day be sitting at that juice bar having these moments together. Yeah. And he yeah. built this 25 years of foundation as friends. And he shows up in so many ways. Like when you guys had everybody get here, when I rolled in and that, you know, three years ago and all those people just came around you guys. You, you were here for the music night, right? No, remember oh, I, you remember were, I, you I, I, flying in I at that came moment. in that night. Yeah. It's so crazy. Is, so this, it was in this room. But yeah, we, we were here and, and, and uh, Tim McGraw, God bless him, was, was here and said, go get a guitar. And so he we just started playing a couple old country whiskey songs on guitar. And then somehow it merged over in the gospel songs. And then somehow it became this worship session, which I'm yeah. not a huge worship music fan, you know. But there's a man, when I hear Waymaker, it flattens me to this day. It yeah. flattens me because it, the, I mean, God lifted the roof off of my home and just entered. And um, my sister, okay, when we went and switched rooms because there's a piano uh, down the hall and my sister played piano. It was just, it was magical. 
And uh, at the, while that was going on, you texted the picture that you, it's the picture outside the plane window. It was just like this golden sunset. It was unbelievable. I, that's, that picture's on our electric picture frame at home in our kitchen, and I see it almost daily. Wow. And so I'm reminded of Sage and every day, and that that night, you that evening you had here, where you guys were just it's inundated with love with your friends here and the music and yeah, it was crazy because I I sometimes take music for granted because you do it for a living. You want to yeah. ruin something yeah. as a hobby? Do it for a living. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's occasionally, you know, you want to. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that one. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, 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 I know. Sure. Yeah, I get well, it. Well, speaking of, before we get to totally, I want to start a little bit before because as long as we've been friends, I don't really know what, like why you started acting when you're, you're San Diego, right? You're that's where you guys started. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've I've told the story a few times. I when I was little, well, my I I was kind of a restless kid, you know, and just I, that ADD brain. I was you know bouncing off the walls, and I think, I think my my mom especially was just you know thinking, you know, as a parent, what what can I get Eric's mind into to help him settle down and focus so he's not you know running around on the tabletops in the classroom and the teacher's like mr close you know and the kids are like oh you know the kids are i mean that was me i was a kid like bouncing from table to table and you know and it's funny because you're half that and you're half the well-behaved guy i don't know what that's great. yeah I it's love been that. it's been a yeah it's been a pro work in process you know um so i think my mom some you know she was probably part of the pta i think and mm -hmm. you know so she was in there and got me so you know the the suggesting maybe get involved in a play or something so i remember in sixth grade i did uh we did a play uh, we did robin hood and they wrote this character called david o the common and i that was my character and so i probably was at that time 11 sixth grade so i ended up like memorizing the entire play. So I knew everybody else's lines. So, you know, kids at age, they, for, they forget their lines, you know, they're up on stage and it's like, totally. Uh, and they're like twiddling and they're looking at the audience and the parents are going, Oh no. You know, and I go, Hey, your lines, this, you know, and, you know, and so that's the thing, by you know, the way, it's just, was this thing. So I, I, I had fun doing it and then I didn't really do anything with it for a while. Then I went to junior high and I got into, um, the drama program there and I did a couple of plays and I really enjoyed it. So that kind of that seed was planted. Mm -hmm. but then I went screwed off in high school and college, you know, and, and while I was in college is when I started really at that point, like, okay, I better start thinking about what I'm going to do for a living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm graduations are coming really fast. <laughs> so I was in Europe studying in Spain and a friend of mine told me she was going to go into the movie business. And I was like, wow, that sounds kind of cool. So I started thinking about directing. I was like, okay, I want to be a director. I really love telling stories and, and this will be really fun. So I'm going to go back to SC. I'm going to declare a major <clears throat> and then I'm going to start taking film classes. So while I was in film class, some of my friends at USC were going, Hey, would you be in my student film? So I started doing that and I was like, wow, this is kind of fun. But I didn't know you could make a living as an actor. I had no idea. I just thought that was just, it was just something, it's a play. They you write about that. You, yeah, it's yeah, a play. Yeah. So, I, didn't, I didn't even know songwriting was a job when we moved yeah, here. Right. Really, I was I just like, hey, if it's, it's something I can do, it'll be fun. And and so I, I, in order to graduate, I had to take, I needed like four more hours. So I was living in San Diego at my parents' house. I was working. And one day a week, I would drive to LA to take a class at USC to get my hours. It was a summer class. I still had one more semester to go. Boy, before you could do online, it cost yeah. people a lot of gas. Yeah, I drive my ass up to LA. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm in this acting class and Bill White was the head of the drama department at USC. And he was, you know, doing some sort of exercise in the class. And someone leans over, I don't know who it was. Someone leans over to me and they, and they go, hey man, have you, have you ever thought about doing this for a living? And I'm like, what? And he's like, acting. And I'm like, can you make a living at? I mean, I don't know. I mean, all my buddies are going to go work for their dads and their companies are going to become business guys. And I was like, my dad's a surgeon. I don't, I'd love to be a surgeon, but that. I, yeah, yeah, you know, you can't have surgeons who run on tabletops and they're like, you know, so I just, my brain wasn't going to, that wasn't good for me. It wasn't a good Scalpel fit. Catch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so I thought, I didn't really thought, maybe I should check into that. So upon graduation, my brother Randy and I were roommates with Christopher and Randy was modeling and, and working with this agency. I was getting him out for commercials and stuff. And he said, dude, while you're trying to be a director, why don't you come do some, you know, some modeling and stuff. And I started auditioning for these commercials and I 
booked commercials right away. Got my Screen Actors Guild card, and I'm like, I think I need to shift gears here. I think God's calling me to do something different. And so then that's when I shifted gears and really said, okay, I'm all in. Got into acting class, and and there's a lot more details to the story. Obviously, but yeah, from there, yeah, yeah. it's it's cra crazy because it's it's weird. It feels like this thing that you that doesn't really exist. How do you well? How do you get an album with your name on it? And how do you yeah. how do you write a TV show or be into it? And then once you crack the thing, you're like, that was it. That was the big bad wolf. I couldn't get through. <clears throat> but it is, it is it is like a ten year process. A lot of times to break through. The first thing I ever saw you in was uh, a, a movie called The Stranger Beside Me, and you, you were a rapist. Yeah, it was so, Tiffany, um, Tiffany Thiessen. Yeah. I just remember Tiffany seeing it. Yeah, it was one of those movie of the week things, and it was, it was good. It was really good. And then I think we met like a year or two later, and I had written a song called The Stranger Beside Me, but it wasn't like that at all, but I got the title from from there. And then we met, and then I'm I like, didn't even know that. Yeah, I, I don't, oh, I don't know crazy. if I, I, thought no, maybe I, I told I you that no way idea. back then. I had written a song called The Stranger Right Beside Me, and uh, and then I realized, I'm like, oh my god, that was Eric. So we went back and found him before you could just Google everything. And I'm like, oh shit, that was Eric. So I told him, I'm like, yeah, I saw you in a movie long before, without a trace. Yeah, there was no Google then. <laughs> yeah, there's no. I would think there were cell phones, you man. To, you had to wait for that movie to come back on. <laughs> you know, wait, there's that movie again. Six months later. So, so I mean, you've been out, you did soap operas early, right? And then I started, yeah, early, early on. One of my first full time gigs was working on Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, and that lasted about 11 months. And during that, and then when that ended, there was about a 10 month period where I didn't get any work. So I was like doing theater, working in the theater, learning light boards, you know, just trying to just hang in there. And then I got a pilot for CBS. And while we're waiting to see if that was going to get picked up, this other pilot came along called McKenna. And there's this thing, if you're already obligated to a job, you're under contract, you can only go and audition for this other show in what they call second position. So I went and auditioned in second position and the showrunner, Gil Grant, goes, I want you to be in my show. We got to figure out how to get you out of that other show. So I had to get the blessing of the president of CBS Studios, Jeff Zagansky, and the producers um, from these guys' trilogy, who were the producers of the show. And they all said, we give you our blessing go be successful in this. And I went and did the show and that just really opened a ton of doors. And as a matter of fact, that show we shot in Bend, Oregon, where I now live Crazy. like a quarter mile from the set is where I live now. You're kidding. Yeah. So it was, <laughs> there was a, yeah. Isn't that amazing? So I did the show there and now I'm, that's where I'm back. Yeah, there's a crazy story about it. when you, how you met Carrie, when you met your wife or there's something, you almost missed a flight. And this. Well, so that's a, yeah, that's a pretty cool story. So I was at, uh, I had, had been at church on Tuesday night for like, Tuesday night Bible study or whatever. And the I went to, so a lot of people don't know this, but I went to an all African-American church. I was like the only white member other than my two brothers. And, and it was awesome, dude. I, it was in Altadena, California. It was called Miracle City Apostolic Church. And I, the reason I went there is I was doing a play and I had just started rediscovering my faith. So I was just kind of like, I was in limbo there for a while, just kind of going, I don't know. And I was like, God, if you want anything to do with me, here I am, I've kind of made a mess of my life and things just started happening. It was really miraculous in many ways. Yeah. And so this guy met this guy, George, I asked him if I could go to church with him. And he, he was like, okay, he goes, you better come with an open mind. I didn't know what he meant. So we got there and man, I was just embraced with so much love and, yeah. you know, there was no racism or anything. We, we just loved on each other. And I just felt so welcome. And that, that became my faith family for like five years. And so I was there and Bishop was preaching on this tiny little Bible verse, let your yes be yes and your no be no meaning be good on your word. And if you say no, that's still your word. Yeah. So if you tell somebody, no, nah, it's not, it's not working for me. I mean, Strauss loves that. It doesn't work for me. You knows know, it's like, a, knows yeah. a complete sense. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's a yeah. great line. Yeah. And so I had promised this guy that I had met in Europe years before that uh, we stayed in touch. I had promised him I'd be at his wedding in Dallas on a Saturday, March 7th. I was in his wedding party on March 6th on Friday in Dallas but my work schedule changed and they, and I called his parents and said, I hate to do this, but I got to cancel. I can't come. My work schedule changed. So and you're acting. It's not like you're, you're working at. No, I was work, I was, I was a yeah, lead yeah. on a soap so, opera. I couldn't miss Friday. They switched the schedule on me. So I canceled. Well, Saturday morning, I'm laying in my apartment on mattresses on the floor. My brothers and I had just moved in. We didn't even have furniture yet. 
And I'm laying there at like 5.30, 6 in the morning, and I hear that voice going, let your yes be yes, your no be no. And I went, damn it, I'm supposed to be at that wedding. I gave that guy my word. I'm supposed to be there. So I wake my brothers up and I go, dudes, you got to get me to LAX right now. I got to get on a flight to Dallas. And they're like, what? I go, I got to be at that wedding. I, I told that guy I'd be there. I got to go. And they're like, all right, let's go. They drove me down to LAX. And this was back when you could literally park at the curb. At the, running and, by and ticket. Park the car and walk in. They walked me to the gate, the whole thing, and left the car. No, it wasn't like, well, the owner of the convertible <laughs> Celica, you know, moved the car immediately. It was just like, whatever. There probably was no cell phone, so you had to go in and buy. You couldn't even Went look at when is the yeah, flight leaving. No, no. Yeah. No, I called American Airlines on a dial. <laughs> you know this thing. We're so Hello, old. American Airlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're proper geezers, man. Wow. And so, well, we were alive yeah, when that happened. Yeah, yeah, isn't that crazy? Oh. My kids, kids out there are like, what's he doing? What's that? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I flew to Dallas and I went to the wedding. And at that reception, I was standing there and I looked across the room and I saw this gal, not this girl. Gal, that's a really old gal. Yeah. Yeah. I looked across and I saw Carrie. And the rest was history. It's crazy. Yeah. But had I not gone, and that was the day of the wedding. I woke up that morning, flew to Dallas, and was at the wedding that evening. I got. I have to ask, because I'm a weirdo for details. Did the tux, did you just stop by the rental place on the way? I had, I had a suit. I forgot a belt. <laughs> <laughs> so literally, I had no belt. Um, I haven't worn a belt in 20 years, by the way. So I, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I don't even think I took a tie. Maybe I did take a tie, but I, I, tie I just threw it 10. in a bag. <laughs> And maybe even forgot socks and, and just <laughs> rolled in. And then I was like, I'd never been to a wedding before either. Cause I, that was crazy. People told me if you go to a wedding, you might run into, you might meet the person you're going to marry. And I wasn't ready to get married. And so that's what happened. But I also had to get a gift, right? You got to show up with something. So my friend's name is Chip who got married. So I went to like some store and I'm so cheap. I found this beautiful glass bowl and had a little chip out of it. And I'm like, oh, that's perfect. His name's Chip. <laughs> So I literally, how bad is that? That's from the duty-free shop in the airport because yeah, that's yeah, when you were shopping you, probably, You know, right? as soon as they got it, he's like, why did you bring us a chip ball? Yeah. Oh, is it my name? <laughs> yeah, he didn't think because No, no, name. I he think thought, that was in the, I was in the dumpster the next day. Yeah, it's funny because I, I say it all the time, even on here, but like you can live as though nothing is a miracle or as though everything is. And I mean, you, you look in clearly soberly at your life and there's so many alignments and you've been willing to follow um, your life has neither been perfect nor easy, but you've been blessed because I think you followed the the urgings, the nudgings, um, with maybe a little bit less resistance than than maybe I did for a little less time. But I know you had your time. Yeah, you know, Brad, I I think about that. I think it's it's a thin line from, and I've probably done a lot of the same things you've done, really. Yeah, yeah. And yet, there may be that one little gene that makes the experience different you know yeah. what i'm saying i i don't I, the last thing i want to do is paint like this sort of picture like oh yeah i've just got it all together i'm just you know i'm you know i never do anything wrong that's far very far from the truth and and have had definitely struggles too and wrestled with a lot of things so you know but it's it can it is a fine line between what one person's journey is another who you know what i'm saying yeah and and tell you the length of time that you spend in line with god's will but i mean that's a wide sentence you know but the length of time you spend in god's will there are blessings from it there, when oh, i make yeah. a when i make a decision based on the right thing the right reason it's usually a blessing in it and i don't know if the blessing is like god i'm going to bless you for this or if there's just blessing in making the right decisions like obvious health decisions that you make doing the right thing is going to make you healthy you're going to feel better you're going to um move along and i don't think that god comes and curses you when you're making wrong decisions he loves us he feels bad for it but we there's definitely a um there are repercussions and then when you think you're doing everything pretty well, then the left hook comes in and you get the big one, you know? And I, I'm, I'm sober a long time. I, my marriage is great and it took work mostly from her, but uh, got three sons, life is good, you know? And we're, we're doing well and stayed struggling, but then all of a sudden he has this year of sobriety. It was 2019 is the best year of my life, without a doubt. And I, so I mean, it was just amazing. And I'm like, this is so good. And then it was like, you know, that year was God's gift to me. But man, I'm kind of thinking, oh, here's the new beginning for, for the world being like, I want it. Like, I see it. Like, I perceive it. And my sons are going to have sons. And and they're going to have children. And I'm going to be, you know, the head honcho of this family. That, whatever it is. 
ironically, I don't have plans anymore. I really don't. Um, any plans. Like God will do what he needs to do. And I want to try to fall in line with that. And and honestly, I feel like I there's I find meaning in Sage's life and death. I find meaning in my friendships that I didn't know was there before. I find meaning in your brother's life. I learned so much from him. Um, I'm way closer to you. We've known each other longer, whatever. But Christopher was like one of those, like just a little tiny thing. We rode motorcycles a little bit. We have all done that together. And uh, Christopher and I showed up for the first time to ride together. I think one of his friends came with him or something, but it's basically just the two of us talking about it. And we both showed up and we were both wearing vans with no socks to ride a motorcycle. And I thought, <laughs> this is my guy. You know what I mean? Yep. And like, I always wanted to be a surfer and he really was one. And he really just lived like a gypsy. You know what I mean? Yeah. He never got really locked down to anything. And it's, I'm, I just feel like he lived every moment and somehow in the inner workings of him, he knew that his days were numbered and he wasn't going to get locked down to an office thing. I'm going to live while I'm here. And I, 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 and I feel like Sage, a lot of times there were things in him that knew that he wasn't going to be around this long and the way they lived. And I don't, I don't know, there's, I don't even know where all that's going, but I just, there's, a, there's a lot of parallels in there. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Christopher definitely lived lived it to the fullest uh i you know people that even yesterday i had coffee with a group of guys and they were and the two guys that were in this group there just were they just talked about the impact his life had on them in the short time they knew each other and i mean you guys were brothers too man i'm telling you when you guys met you you, yeah. you hit it off right away and and i mean and you and you and brett were two i think the last two people outside of our family who were with Christopher before he passed away. I have a picture of you guys with your hands on his, on him, right? You know, the day before he passed. Like I, I, I think I yeah. told you the story, but I'll tell everybody yeah, the no, story tell it. Um, of, of that. And I may have even told it on here before, but it's so intense that um, I am not this guy. I talk about near death experience and all this stuff on here. It's become important to me because there's someone that's important to me there not not that my father who's who is in heaven is not important to me is but there's a different thing with, yeah, with your son and it's just just different so i become very aware of, of things and and uh, i try to call myself out when it, emotion is taking hold and when it's really like i literally feel god or feel my son and so i'm just open about what has happened there so the day that that christopher died your brother we uh we went over to his house you're there by the way you like literally stopped your life and took care of your brother for years before this happened. It's amazing. Um, I know he's grateful for that. And I don't, you know, I, don't, I know I you don't need, a, I don't, I you don't need a pat on the back. No, for, I would, but I mean, I, you, you and did, I would, I would do it. This, I'd do it the same way. Again. Literally when COVID you like literally went and uh, quarantined yourself for two weeks in Germany for a 20 minute <laughs> blood infusion. And then you guys flew, spent two more weeks quarantined and flew home. Like, man, that's a good brother. I would just have to tell Brett, hey man, just go to Germany by yourself. <laughs> go to Germany. He, yeah, Christopher did that to me the second time. He went back to Germany and I go, I go, let's go. And he goes, now I'm going on my own. Yeah, I, I go, can't, yeah, can't yeah. have you do it. <laughs> but um, so we we had, we had spent some time over there and it was, yeah, it was kind of becoming um obvious that it was the, the time was getting short. And and uh you said, Would you guys like to go say goodbye to Christopher? And I said, Yeah. I'd love to. And so we went in and it's, you know, it's funny because I come from the charismatic church where you lay hands on people and pray. And, and it, it probably appeared as though that was what was happening. But for some reason, when I sat down next to your brother who's dying, <clears throat> I just wanted to touch him. I just wanted to feel where he was at. And I touched his leg. This is going to sound crazy, but it's, I'm just telling the truth. I touched his leg and man, it was like I felt Sage sitting right beside me, but like behind me where I couldn't see him, but like I was here. I felt Sage just sitting right there. I felt, I mean, and so I, I'm like, am I, at the moment, in the moment I just soaked it up. So it probably looked like we were praying for Christopher. I wasn't, I was just literally like touching him and I could feel it. Um, and uh, later I tried to like, okay, what part did emotions play in that? This is my friend is dying. The brother of my really good friend, I know your whole family, your parents um, mean a lot to me. I know what they're getting ready to go through a little bit. And it's, so there's emotion in that. And I try to go to like temper how much of this is emotion, how much this really happened. But I'm telling you, I believe with every fiber of my being that Sage was there to like walk Christopher, like he was straddling the line. It was happening at the moment. I mean, a matter of hours later, he died, right? It was. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I think, I think sometime the next day. 
Yeah. Okay, the next day. Yeah. Okay, so I think you were there. So, um, yeah. Okay, so, but, but, but whatever that was. But you have to remember, you have to remember, they're outside of time. Yeah, right. There's no time. To us, there's time. Yeah. That's. And I, so <laughs> I've watched a, all these near-death experience things and read yeah. all these books, and there are people that come to greet the, the person there, and they say, well, of course Sage would be there too. But I felt him sitting there as, as clear as we're sitting here right now. And it was, I mean, I cried, you know, sitting there with your brother. And then we left and I felt, you know, he had that kind of uh, like the feeling after a run. By the way, we at some point we have to talk about your freaking triathlon uh, hobby now. <laughs> but that, that runner's high you get or whatever yeah. it might be. Um, I had that as we were leaving and then I just kind of like contemplated it. But it makes perfect sense to me that I felt sage right there with him. And it, it, it's <clears throat> our closest to your family is not an accident. And um yeah, I just I just know Sage was there to, to There's no question. Walk There's no down. question, and I don't doubt that for a minute. You know, I had um something similar to that. Uh <clears throat> I don't dream a lot. And uh after Christopher passed, I had, you know, a couple of dreams about him. But then I had what I would consider uh an affirmation or a vision or a dream that I just was, was so uh, brought me a lot of peace was I was behind Christopher as he was entering heaven. This is what I saw. And so he was, I knew it was him because I was behind him, but, and, and I sort of, so it's like this bird's eye view. And as it, and it was, it was almost like staring into just, this the most perfect white you could see. It was just this beautiful white and that you couldn't see anything like a cloud almost. Right. Mm -hmm. And as we're moving towards this cloud, you start to see shapes and movement in the cloud coming sort of appearing. And then out of the cloud, this sort of this white people start coming. Mm -hmm. And the first person I saw was our grandfather uh, Nudge Papa, which is Hungarian for grandfather. And we were really close with him. We, <clears throat> Your mom's dad, obviously. Yes. We were very close with him because he and our Nudge Mama, our grandmother, they used to take care of us a lot when my parents would go do things and stuff. So he was the first person. It's his face. He looked younger. And he had this, he had the most contented look on his face. It wasn't like, Christopher! It was just like, he was like, you're here. Like it was just, and he went up and he, and he approached my brother and I recognized every, even though I didn't pick out the other people, I recognized everybody. And then there was people that were my family that I didn't even know that people had gone generations before and just, and there were thousands of people, I mean, just people coming. And my grandfather reaches out and puts his hand on my brother's face and just, just like that, just like, I'm so glad you're here. And he pulls my brother into this embrace and he's holding my brother and people are going like this and, you know, touching yeah. my brother's head and touching his back and just like, we're so glad you're here. And then my grandfather turns and this is the grace of God. I think he turns and I'm seeing all this. This is, it's so vivid to me. And he turns and he goes like this and the, everybody kind of parts away and about 20 feet away, there's this rock and you see someone sitting on it. And all you see is like this kind of linen, garment and these sandals, little hairy legs kind of, and to about here down. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Jesus. Yeah. And he was just sitting there just, and my brother starts walking towards him and he stands up and, and I don't see his face. He just stands up and he embraces my brother, just holds him. And I was like, man, isn't that, isn't that the love of God that instead of Jesus going, I got to be first to see Christopher. I got to be the first to welcome him to heaven. I know what will bring Christopher. We'll just this overwhelm his heart with joy is see his grandpa and his yeah. family. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to be with me for eternity. Yeah. And then he hugged him. And then this is kind of the corny part, but my brother loved to surf. You know, he yeah. was, yeah. it was his passion. He just loved, loved surfing. It was tough for him living in Tennessee. <laughs> no, he was like, yeah. he was trying to bring a surf park to, to <laughs> central Tennessee. Cause he was just like, man, yeah. the waves here. He was an outdoorsman. I mean, yeah. he loved the outdoors, which we can talk more about that too. But, and then Jesus reaches behind his back. I never see his face. He reaches behind his back and he pulls out my brother's surfboard, his favorite surfboard. And then all of a sudden it just kind of cuts and I'm behind the two of them 
and they're inside the barrel of this perfect wave. The sun's coming through the water and they're just like, and they're laughing and surfing. And they just go on on this beautiful tube because we used to tell Christopher, man, you're going to surf with Jesus when you get there, man. Yeah. Like, how cool is that? And, yeah. then I, and then I woke up and I was just like, wow, did that, was, did that really, did I just see that? And the one part I didn't tell you is then when Christopher was entering and all those people were coming and my grandfather and everybody, yeah. I had this moment where I kind of rose up like way high and I saw movement and I looked and as I looked, I was looking over like heaven and there were people coming from all different places and crowds were welcoming their loved one. So it was like, it wasn't just happening to Christopher. It was happening to people as far as you could see. And I was like, how awesome of, of a homecoming. And I don't, we don't know what heaven's like, but I just, it was so reassuring that, I, and, and, you know, and that's part of this journey is knowing that, well, you and I've talked about this. You know that you're going to see Sage again. Yeah. You know, you're going to see your dad again. I know that I'm going to see Christopher again. You know, that, that big meat hook hand of his, yeah. it's just going to be like, you know. I mean, I, I read a ton of this stuff now. That is so absolutely in line with the the basic. I mean, everyone's thing is different, but it's so completely in line. And I, I think that answers the question of people that go that love golf and say, "Is there?" My buddy Tim says, "Is, is there going to be golf in heaven?" I'm like, I don't know, but <laughs> if you want to play golf in heaven, I'm sure you're going to be allowed to. Um, but why not? If it brings you it's joy, so and, in yeah. line. That is so in line with every thing that I read, I mean, you, you got to get, it's a gift that you were, that you were given that I really kind of want one of those things, but I'm, I'm so into it. I think God's going, yeah, you know, you know what? You need to have faith and just let me, let me, uh, yeah. Like, there's a great moment in the shack when Jesus is walking with, uh, uh, is it Mac? Yeah. They're walking on the water and there's all these trout swimming around and, and this big, beautiful trout goes by and Jesus goes, man, I've been trying to catch that one for a while. And he goes, well, you're Jesus. Can't you just command it into the net? He goes, what fun would that be? Yeah. I mean, how cool is that? Just, yeah. Jesus, like, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. There's got to be sport to it because as yeah. you were talking about that, I'm like, I wonder if, because I've surfed like twice in my life because I don't live near. The, yeah, yeah, it's dangerous. Even dude. my Florida, where doing? I grew up, is <laughs> was the, the the flat side of the water, you know, the west coast of Florida where there's no waves. And I always wanted to be a surfer. I'm like, am I going to get to be a surfer in heaven or do you have to put the work in here for that to be your thing? I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. I think I think you'll be able to surf. I think you better do whatever. But I don't think it'll be, I don't think it'll come easy. Yeah, yeah. I think exactly. there'll be the joy in trying to figure it out. You know, and by all. You just won't drown. There's work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You won't, you won't drown or there is, there is no such thing. Right. I mean, there's work. I think that we, we, like, if we learn how to love work here, then we're setting ourselves up for what it, it's supposed to be. Because I do believe that there's work and there's purpose and it has to be. Um, and maybe it requires there to be some evil and darkness in the world for there to be some, some, uh, purpose that we have but uh you saying that like i literally see all of that this fact like i don't look at it as like oh eric had a nice little i mean it's too much detail and it's too like the the seeing your grandfather but younger and healthy i mean i just hear it all the time you want to study near-death experience uh someone that just, like pats me on the head and says oh i'm sure that you need to know think that um i, I certainly spent less hours watching and reading it than i have uh, because there's no scientific way to disprove the experiences these people have. And the consistency is more consistent than any, you tell 10 people, it's like the game of telephones, tell 10 people the same story and then have them tell it to somebody else. And it's completely different. So the interpretations vary very little, but the spirit of what's being told and those near death experiences, which is what you're experiencing and those people coming to the, to, to greet. And you, yeah. you like not knowing that you knew them, but not being able to necessarily pick out who it is. Very let, me, let me tell you something, man. I've heard, you know, I've been I've been a believer in Jesus for a long time, right? Yep. I've heard a million great sermons, some like like really really incredible. There's people with a real gift that you can give a give a message that really resonates with I've you. Heard a million bad ones too. But yeah, right. Yeah, same. <laughs> but what I'll tell you is none of those those sermons convinced me that there was God. The only reason I'm convinced here God is because God showed me yep. that he was God in one changing my own life, but also in the things that have happened. And let me give you one, I'm just going to give you one story and there's a million of them. Yeah. And a lot of times people can chalk stories off to coincidence. Someone could say, well, 
yeah, you felt sage, but that could have been this. Or this thing with Christopher that happened, there could be. <laughs> yeah, right? I can't prove it. Right. I was, I was doing a play in Hollywood, and I lived downtown with my brothers in downtown LA, and that was about eight miles away on the 101 freeway. And look, I'll preface it with this. I can tell you the story, and there will be people out there who go, oh, he made that story up. It's fine. They can whatever they want to think. But I'm telling you, this is the God's honest truth. So I had this little convertible Celica, 1980 Toyota Celica. This thing was a rickety, just a little, a little lap belt, you know, custom convertible job. I mean, this was like a, a tuna can. Okay. <clears throat> and I was driving home at about 2.30 in the morning on the 101 freeway. I was the only person on the freeway. There was nobody. And in the middle are these concrete walls that go. So you can't see the other side of the freeway in certain sections of the 101, especially on the windy sections because they don't want people coming across the lanes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving home. I got the music on. I am just, I'm loving life. You know, you talk about you like life couldn't get any better right now. I'm doing a play. I'm, I'm acting. I'm like, it's kind of happening for me. And I was, you know, I had my relationship with God was good, whatever. And I'm driving along. And like I said, there wasn't a soul on the freeway, got music on, and I literally hear this audible voice, like my conscious, it's me, it wasn't like this booming voice, but I hear this voice in my head say, get in the slow lane. And I'm like, and I'm driving, and I'm, I'm literally like, get in the slow lane? I've got eight miles to go until I'm home. So I keep driving, then I hear it again, get in the slow lane. I turn the radio down, and I'm like, oh my God, you want, why do you want to get in the slow lane? I'm like, I got, I'm going like 75 miles an hour or whatever. And I, I got a long way to go. And then I hear it again, get in the slow lane. I'm like, all right, all right. And I go over the slow lane. And as I'm going, I, I kid you not, 10, 12, 15 seconds. As I'm going around the bend on the 101 freeway at 2.30 in the morning is a station wagon coming the other way with its headlights off in my lane. And then if I hadn't moved in that five seconds, I would have hit that car head on. Been gone. How do you explain that? There, there's no, that all I need is that, that one story right there to tell you that God was like, it's not your time, Eric. And, and there are people, there are, well, we all have our time. Yeah. My time's coming, every one of us. But in that moment, God was like, just listen to me. And I can tell you how many times I haven't listened to him. <laughs> okay. I don't listen to him every time. We're in such a damn rush in this world yeah. that I'm bringing it back to what we're talking about. If He's, God is always going, I am right here. I'm here. I'm right here with you in your grief. I'm right here with you in your joy. You know, I, all of it. I'm right here. Slow down. Just take a pause. You were talking about the relentless um, pursuit of hurry or whatever the, yeah, you know. Yeah, um, um, yeah the John relentless elimination John, of hurry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John yeah, Mark Comer's book. It's, great book. He's brilliant. I mean, and it's like, it's true. It's just like, God's going, I'm right here. You just got to slow down and I'll show you. I'm right here. And you and I and, and Michelle have talked a number of times about all the things that have happened when we just slow down and we look and it's like Sage going, hey, mom, dad, I'm right here. I'm good. I love you. I miss you. You know, I Christopher's saying the same thing, but we'll see each other again. Yeah. And it's good. You're you There's know, a lot of man. them. We have a lot of them, but we have one. Uh, you, so you and your brother, Randy, drove a dog, which I can't imagine, <laughs> from, from San Diego to Fort Lauderdale. Yep. And you stopped by our place. That in, was in December. In man. Florida, in December. And whatever, we I, I've talked on here about it, but Sage had this thing about 9-11. He would just always, it's nine, look, it's 9-11, it's 9-11. Anytime he saw 9-11, he pointed out, I have no idea why. Now I think maybe the whole time it was so that now I can have the gifts of 9-11s all the time. Michelle and I were just, I was giving my driver's license number to the rental car place the other day. And she's like, there's a 9-11 in your and my driver's license number, which is funny. But right? you and Michelle and I are standing in our uh, little kitchen in Florida, and we're talking about that 9-11 thing. And it just you remember I, what time it was, too? Oh, was it 9-11? You looked up at the you looked up at the clock on your on your um, the microwave on, on your microwave, and we had just walked into the kitchen and started talking about that. And you go, "Oh, look!" And then it turns to nine twelve, and you go. You go, it was just 9-11 when we walked right, in. Right, so the, we were talking yeah, about it and first. I'm like, oh, and then it turned yeah. in. And so I, we're, you were kind of laughing about it. We're having that talk where we get it. And then you go to Fort Lauderdale that afternoon. Yep, and check into the hotel. Night. Yep. Yeah, so I I get there and I was going to stay with, I was like, do I stay with my brother and his family? But it was crowded. They were in an Airbnb. And I'm like, no, I'm going to. So I book a room at the hotel. I walk up to the desk. And this is a massive air, airport, you know, Hilton at the at the airport. And I walk up, I check in, 
and the guy hands me my room key. And I'd just been with you a couple hours before, and you and I, Michelle, were talking about this. Hands me a room key. It's room 911. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> of all the rooms. And, and, and I think I've told you five is a number that just comes up for me all the time, right? I usually get a hotel room that's got a five in it somehow. It's 225, <laughs> 205, whatever, 405. They handed it to me, and I literally just went, of course. Of course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was just, of course. It, it wasn't like I was shocked. I was just like, of yeah. course, this is, yeah. this is how it goes, man. Yeah. And, I mean, the hellos. Uh, you, I mean, you can discount that kind of thing if you, if you feel you like want it. To. But I think, yeah, and I, I probably did. I was probably the guy that went, well, yeah, People maybe. People discount yeah. God all day long, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and it doesn't like, like we, I shouldn't have to have that, but I think God knows the, the paper thin strength of my faith sometimes. And he gives me that when I need it. And, uh, there's a certain synergy with people like you talk, like get in the slow lane, get in the slow lane. And I wonder, does he talk a little louder when it's life threatening? And are we listening harder when we're grieving? Cause I know that I'm listening harder, that the veil is thinner, but he's probably talking all the time. And when I'm rushing past it, there's all of these nudges that are going to put me in the right thing. We read Jesus calling every morning because there's usually something I don't know. It's just a book written by a woman that's using scripture, by the way, but it's freaking amazing. But somehow, <clears throat> I mean, often, often it is literally addressing what we're, we're rushing. I'm like, I'm too much going on, busy, and I can't do this. And I'm, I feel too committed to many people. And then she'll read Jesus calling and say, slow down, sit with me today. Give me the silence of, you know, that, and I'm like, oh my God, it's, there's always directions there. And, uh, we just have to take the time to listen to them. And, and if we're not listening, then we're not going to hear it. And, and I, you know, we, yeah, we're, our lives are fast and rushed, but there's, there's, uh, yeah, the there, world is fast, man. There's instruction there and there's peace. And I'm, the truth is that the, I, I don't know if I would, it would be wise to have started my career with this level of serenity and I want to have her peace, but I'm much less concerned with being somebody. Um, and, and having to make all, I mean, I, I want to make money. I'm not crazy. You know, it's, we get to do a lot of cool stuff and, um, you, your, your job as well. I mean, you've been all over the world. It's, it's great, but the important things are not those things to me anymore. They're, uh, they're the, the moments where I find complete peace. There are moments where I find complete meaning and peace and mercy in the absence of my son. Then I, then I hurt later after that but there, and i man I, I treasure those moments where i go this makes sense it makes enough sense i can i can keep functioning because this makes enough sense i don't know if you i don't know if you guys uh, had this experience but i have a friend here in nashville um who his name is jonathan and <clears throat> he's a pastor and uh he had moved here for a new job a few years ago um out here in franklin and four young daughters young wife, married, you know, newly, you know, just young family, just everything's going great. New job, you know, getting to live in tennis, you know, Nashville. And it had a little bit of time before he was going to start his job. So they went somewhere to visit family and his wife sat up in bed and goes, I don't feel good. Something's wrong. And then she plopped over and he was looking at her and he's like, winter, stop messing. You know, what are you doing? Like, thinking she's joking around and he went over and she had had a massive aneurysm at like 34 years old and, and died and left him with four kids. Well, he's also very close with my brother, you know, leaves him widowed with, you know, four daughters. And he was telling Christopher and CJ and I, CJ's, you know, my brother's wife, we were, Christopher's still alive, but he was definitely in it. He was in the trenches, you know, and he said, I would never wish this on anybody. He said, but in my deepest grief, I have never been closer to God. And he goes, and now that I'm healing, you know, because we go, we heal, you know. He goes, I miss how close I was to God in that. He goes, I wouldn't wish this grief and pain on anybody, but I miss the closeness that I had to, to God in that grief. Because as we start to heal Life gets kind of back to normal. We start, you know, it's never normal again, but it's a different normal. But we start back, we get back into that busy pace and the, stress, the stresses of life. But in those those deepest moments, none of that stuff matters. 
I, your job, your whether you're lifting weights or running a marathon or whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter, right? Just like I, I'm so, I just am so deep in this. I just all you can do is just turn to God and go. I just need you. I just need your presence. I relate to that completely. Like I absolutely relate to. I, I kind of miss that. Um, there's uh, my 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 wife's cousin, um, Sammy. He's a great guy. He's from Buffalo, and um. They spent, he spent like a week. They drove straight here when Sage died, whatever. We're, it's, you know, day four or five. And we're just kind of one of those, we'd get up in the mornings and, and sit and have coffee outside and, you know, sitting around talking. And, and I, and we had a, a moderately new car. It was, you know, he's like, I love, I love, love this car. And uh, I'm like, take it. You, you know, driving around, take it. And he goes, no, 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 no. I couldn't, I couldn't replace that car. And I said, no, take, take it take it and he's like no i'm not i'm not gonna if i reckon i said i gave him the keys and sorry mom but i said take the fucking car <laughs> right. and i said i don't care if you drive that car 90 miles an hour into a tree i don't care i don't right i don't care that stuff like, doesn't it didn't doesn't have matter. anything to do with happiness i was so the veil was thin i was god and i were touching you know what i mean the super thin veil i just didn't care and I knew he didn't care about me saying the F word and those kind of things that legalism that I was, I mean, it was so real and tangible and right there on the edge of everything. And so the, the tears were awesome. And it was, and then three months later, our son Jude is a senior in high school. He's taking that car to prom. And I'm like, hey, be careful with your mom's car. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't take long for the veil to thicken yeah. back up, yeah. life to go on, and all of a sudden it's back to, hey, be careful with that car. I'm like, wait, I didn't care about the tree running. And that that is a difference. And so I I love that picture in my mind because I'll go, can I get back to the run the tree into a car guy? Can I get back to where it just doesn't, doesn't matter at all? None of this materials crap matters at all. Thank you for the blessings of whatever it is. Thank you for the comfort when we get to have it, but also thank you for the pain when we get to have that because that's when we really grow. And can I stay in touch with the guy that was okay with running the car into a tree? And it doesn't mean that we go out and th throw every penny we have away and, and aren't responsible. But boy, there's an element of that, not getting attached. The Lord's Prayer, which is because I don't know how to pray very well. I get on my knees every night and say the Lord's Prayer. And the daily bread thing, I mean, it says it for a reason. I don't think God wasted a lot of words, especially when he said, pray like this and give us our daily bread. I think means don't get too stored up with your, I want everything to be perfect forever. And I yeah. mean, I want I want my finances to go, okay, this is all going to last. Yeah, gonna retirement to account. Yeah. Totally. We're, yeah. we're all good. You know, I'm Mr. Mr. Planner, daily bread. And the daily bread is where it's special. So I, I relate to that. I do. And I don't know how uh, Christopher's death was so long. I watched you go through it. And it was, you were grieving ten, him while ten, he was yeah, alive. Yeah. You talked about it during, you're like, I'm already grieving. Um, but with the with the thing with Sage, what your friend said, I completely relate to that because although we have m moved forward, we don't move on, we move forward, you know, uh, we've moved forward and we are healing. And we, but with that comes life again and the the, the cares of the world. Man, I, I do miss some of the emotion in that, the idea that it's just, love that people showed us and God being just in our house and our life. And that was just, just making it through the day. And there was even laughter. I mean, I came, I was laughter. at your house the next day. Um, and, uh, there was, there was some joy. There was joy too was joy. in the, in the, in the pain. I, I remember this, there was this on my way over here. I was reminded of this story. I was a few years ago, there was this Ebola outbreak in, in Africa. <clears throat> and, uh, this this woman came and her sister had just passed away from the Ebola thing. And she just wailed, just, you know, it was just all the grief and pain just coming out. This is her sister. And then, um, and you just, I mean, it was heavy. And the next day she came back to the place where the tents were set up and they were helping people and everything. And she was sitting with the care workers and they were telling stories about her sister. This is literally the next day. And she was laughing and there was this joy that she had. And even though the day before, and it didn't mean she wasn't going to still grieve and be sad, but there was this moving forward, like you're talking about, even within 24 hours of just, you know. We laughed a lot. Like it was, a, it was kind of crazy because the, 
it was literally kind of like, you know, you always, I don't know if you always felt, I have always often thought, maybe kind of cool to see your own funeral. If I died right now, what would it be like? Like, yeah. you know, who would, and Did anybody show up. <laughs> and honestly, there was a bit of that. Like, I mean, the people that came in from million, my best friends from Tampa back then, um, um, just you, just like the, my friend Tim O'Neill. You're you're in Oregon. He's in New Jersey, and my uh, you know my um, Michelle's cousin in Buffalo. They just got in the car and started driving. You just got on an airplane, and it was like wow, like how fortunate are we? To, I mean, this it was kind of like having that. This is your life moment. I'm like, for whatever things that we feel like we haven't haven't accomplished, especially professionally, and what you do and what I do, we kind of stack up those. Okay, well, I did this and this and this. Am I good enough? Um, I was like, man, we've built relationships with amazing people and um, we're loved, like really, really loved. And so there's no possible way we could be that loved. We could love Sage this much and him not know it. And that was my biggest concern. I hope he left this earth knowing how much we loved him. Um, and, I, and I think I feel like he did. And I feel like he's in a place where he understands it. But that was really important to me. And that amount of it's just the people showing up is it, it kind of makes me feel like the, the people coming to see Christopher with your grandfather leading yeah. the way. It's similar. You don't really know until you, uh, God, you don't want to have to find out this way. So don't find out this way. But it's it's kind of amazing if you stop and we were able to experience something that you really shouldn't experience until you're gone in that moment. And we realized how much we were loved and how much Sage was loved. And I, it's crazy to say, but it was a beautiful time. It was well, a beautiful we're experience. conduits of that love, God's love. And, and, and that's one way I think, you know, our creator reaches out to us during these, I mean, man, we live in a tough world, man. It's, and it's always been this way. I mean, it's like every day I was talking to my sister-in-law today. I mean, it was what, 10 years ago, there was that massive tsunami that wiped out like 500,000 people I mean, that, in Sri Lanka. And that, I mean, that's probably the biggest national natural disaster in my lifetime. Yeah. Every day, the guys in the helicopters, you know, that, you know, just two days ago on the, in the Blackhawks and, and, you know, and so, I, I mean, there's, there's no, it's hard, these, these things that we wrestle with, these things that happen in life and the questions of why and why, you know, and, it, I, and I think it's okay to ask why, you know, we talked about God can handle it. I remember my brother, it was crazy. He was standing out in the rain. There was a big rainstorm here and he was literally out in his backyard, like shaking his fist at God. And he was like buck naked in the pouring down rain, just going, why? You know, it's like. And my, my niece looks out and goes, mom, dad's out in the rain naked, screaming at the sky, you know, because he was pissed at God. Yeah. Like, he's like, you're taking, you're giving me this now at 48 years, 45 years old. What? Yeah. I got a family. And, you know, we ask those whys. And I had talks with your brother about that. It's yeah. me, I'm, 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 I'm questioning. I'm questioning. It's okay. It doesn't mean I'm doubting. I'll tell you this. When I get there. I will be able to accept whatever he's got. I have trust. I have faith and I have trust. I am not so married to some sort of dogma or some official this this way or that way. I'm good with surrendering. I think Christians ought maybe not ask themselves, are you good with Hitler being in heaven if he is? I don't know. I'm not saying he is. Are you okay with right. whatever God has? Are you okay to surrender to that? Christians might probably need to ask themselves if they're okay with whatever God has because they don't really know. We don't know. But um, I talked to your brother about it. He was questioning his, like, I mean, by the way, Nobody more obviously going to heaven if if by any of the religious standards we go by back in whatever, which I have a whole different vision of that, <laughs> than your brother. Yeah. And yet he was questioning it. I'm like, Christopher, are you kidding me? You? And then and I thought, well, yeah, we'll question it. That's fine. But I said, I, I'm just telling you from a guy that really believes, and I had lost sage at this point. So my faith was like freaking whatever it was, it was rock hard strong. And I and I was like, dude, do not worry about that. <laughs> Believe me. That's where you, I mean, whatever we've been taught religiously to make us think that we did or said the wrong thing and God's looking for a reason to keep us out of something good. He's not, he's not, he is looking for a reason to include us. He's looking for a reason to love us. We are the prodigal children. We're the prodigal son, all of us. And so maybe I was there that day to reassure your brother, who is the last person I, one of the last people I would possibly be able to think of questioning man, I hope I've done enough to get into heaven. And I'm like, Christopher, man, yeah. we can't earn that. It's a gift. We can't, it we is a gift. It's free. It's free and you're People have a hard time. Them. We have a hard time understanding that because of the world we live in because we're results-based. Yeah. You know, to be as good as Tiger Woods, you got to work your ass off, right? right? To be 
you know, the, these these elite athletes or people in my, you know, in your business. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there there is truth in that, that you work hard at a certain point, you know, there's there, um, there were results and blessings or whatever you want to call it. You know, sometimes there's accolades and but what what you discover in that is that those things don't complete you complete you or make because it's I always I always equate it to this. You go on a, an amazing vacation or you go to a you go to an event and it's a, it's like the night you're being, you know, let's say like an Oscar winner, you know, or you win a Grammy it's or whatever. Pinnacle. <laughs> right. You, and you get these things. And the next day you wake up, you open the mailbox, there's bills in the mailbox, you get a flat tire, you turn on the news. It's, you know, it's a, think about this. You go on a vacation and what you, anybody who's done that, you're laying on the beach and you're doing your thing and it's just awesome. You finally chill out and you're like, oh, this is, I just needed this vacation, man. Oh, this is great. You get then, the, then it's like, okay, tomorrow we're leaving, you know, the day, and then you're like packing and all of a sudden we got to go. Come on, man, we're late. And then everybody's stressing out. You race to the airport and then you get in there and then there's a line and you're like, man, we're going to miss. And then, you know, and then you get on the <laughs> flight and then, oh, the flight's delayed or what? Then you get home and you land at LAX and all of a sudden it's like onto the 405 and it's dead stop traffic <laughs> all the way home. And you're like, ah, that vacation that all that bliss and it's it's gone it's like if we put our hope in that kind of stuff it's like it's the accolade and any of us who've achieved some sort of the world success yeah you realize it's fleeting man and it's and there's nothing wrong with it in those moments if you can enjoy it in the moment go i'm really grateful for this time i have right now but i know it doesn't last this 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 moment but what does last are the memories and the relationships those, those, the, the the greatest gifts in my life are my are the relationships. Absolutely, it's not my job, it's not the vacation I took, it's the people I've met, the the encounters I've had with people. I've had, you know, we were talking earlier in this conversation about these coincidences of running into people. I run into people all over the world, and it's it's become sort of a joke with my wife because because I just because everywhere we go. It doesn't matter. We can be in like a cave. You do be really know everybody somewhere, though. and you're like, "Hey, dude, what's up?" You know, it's like you do know everybody. It's nuts, but but it's like, and that that may not be everybody's story, but I'm just saying that the relationships and those those encounters that I've had in my life, the this your relationship, the relationship I had with you, I cherish. And even though we don't see each other all the time, you are you're my brother. I mean, yeah, you agreed. are. I mean, I really mean that. And it, and um, and. Uh, uh, that's that that's eternal value, okay? All this other stuff, and look, I get it. I get I I I've chased and I still chase certain things in my life, thinking, oh, that's going to make me happier. Or it's going to make me, oh, why isn't this happening? It doesn't go away. It's it's a it's a constant battle, you know. But I know it. That's the craziest thing. Sometimes I go, why am I making such a big deal about this thing? Thank you for tuning in. Part two premieres Tuesday, August 29th.